Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I'm joined today in studio by my trusty sidekick and president and boss, Scott Wyatt. President, how are you? (laughs) Good, thanks. Uh, Good morning, Steve. It's a beautiful day out there. Has anyone ever referred to you as a trusty sidekick? I am your huckleberry. Uh, Yeah. For sure. <laughs> anyway, it's good to see you, and uh, uh, we're in the middle of a beautiful fall here, uh, and we're also in the middle of uh, a run of podcasts talking about a variety of innovative practices on college campuses that that are interesting to us to discuss and to uh, uh, see how we could uh, possibly implement parts of them, uh, and one of those things that we've been discussing. Uh, over the course of a few podcasts now is competency-based education. And and today we're going to talk specifically about a type of competency-based education called direct assessment with our guest who is joining us via phone today from Washington, D.C. Why don't you introduce him? Well, thank you, Steve. Yes, we are delighted to have Paul Fain join us today, um, a writer for Inside Higher Ed, one of the industry's um, most prestigious um, publications, periodicals. Right. Paul, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, President Wyatt. This is fun. How's uh, the world in Washington, D.C. today? Oh, well, it's as always, it's peachy keen. Everybody gets along well here in Washington, <laughs> as you know. Uh, it's, it's, but no, I was, I was at, you know, it's, it's actually, we had some nice weather today, so I'm going to focus on that. It's a beautiful day in Washington. Well, I think it'd be fun to start out, Paul, if you can tell us your, um, just briefly tell us your path to become a writer of higher education. Sure, yeah, happy to do that. I always love to talk about myself. That's one of the one of the ways my job works well. People do like to talk. Um, and, uh, so, yeah, I was um, a, a, a reporter who covered all sorts of things, uh, you know, crime, K-12, etc., uh, briefly early in my career. And I uh, was at a, a weekly paper in Charlottesville, Virginia, where the University of Virginia is located, and uh, it's a pretty influential uh, in- entity in Charlottesville. Um, and after that, I got a job at the Chronicle of Higher Education um, covering college presidency and finance, and that was about 2004. And, you know, I have to say it was a... Uh, I was initially kind of skeptical about becoming a higher ed reporter. I uh, wasn't sure if it would sustain me in terms of interest, and I was wrong about that. This is a, it's a pretty fascinating field to cover, as you know. It's about class, uh, equity, um, uh, workforce development, just so much that higher ed is in the middle of, and it, it feels like more so every day. So I, I did that at the Chronicle for about seven years, and then I came over to Inside Higher Ed about eight or so years ago. I'm now a news editor over here and do all sorts of things. I, I write a lot and I edit a lot. This, uh, Paul, you're right. This is a very interesting time in higher education. Um, Good to hear you say that. I feel the, that way as well. It's just, it's just fascinating. We've so much disruption and so many um, colleges and universities being merged or going out of business and the worries about the birth dearth and what's happening with um, enrollments looking forward a decade ahead and what's, um, you know, and then some of these for-profits and not-for-profits that are doing these really amazing innovations that are disruptive to everybody. This is, I think this has got to be the most interesting time in higher ed that that we've had since, you um, the University of Paris opened its doors, which was yeah, a I, I thousand like, years ago. Yeah, it, it's a common sentiment. You know, I, I I feel like everything changed with the recession. Um, 
you know, you yes. accelerated uh, pressure and pace of change, but it's, it's just continued. And I feel like so much is up for grabs right now. It's, it's exciting and a little, little nerve wracking, I imagine, uh, at institutions. Yeah, the recession in 2008, that it feels to us like everything changed then. Yeah. Everybody's more interested in outcomes and workforce, workforce, attachment, return on investment, yep. a relevance. And yeah. Anyway, hey, we are so we are talking about competency based education. And within that, um, this direct assessment, and not all of our listeners understand competency based education, but it's maybe you can help us define that it's it's quite a paradigm shift. Definitely. You want me to just yeah, give, give it give, a shot. Give what I can. Yeah, it's, it's not the easiest thing to define either. But, um, you know, I think the, the, the general definition that we use is uh, a delivery mode of higher education that doesn't rely on traditional grading. It's more about students uh, demonstrating competency, knowledge, mastery. Um, in predefined competencies across a program um, that can be very aggressive uh, in, in the form of direct assessment, which is totally untethered from the credit hour standard, requires uh, exemptions from the creditors and the federal government to do that. And there's only seven or so institutions that have gotten that kind of uh, uh, competency-based education on steroids, you know, a, a, an aggressive form. Um, but competency-based education itself, I think, of course, is, is quite a shift, too. Uh, you, know, you have to uh, break apart and map uh, your, your credential programs and your majors as competencies, and I gather that's a lot of work and can be difficult and, and controversial. Um, and there's different ways that you can do this. Um, the, the, the biggest, by far, uh, institution in the competency-based space is based out of Utah, uh, Western Governors University. Um, one of the largest universities in the country might be right now, um, over 100,000 students, and they're fully competency-based. Um, and I, I will, I'll be brief here, but one of the things that I think is most fascinating about what they did, they're not direct assessment but they've unbundled their faculty role. So you have right. you know, a subject matter expert and then multiple folks in the faculty, uh, defined as faculty, who, who work with students on a regular basis. And you can do things differently in competency-based ed with, with the faculty role. Yeah, so Western Governors has um, a faculty member who writes the curriculum and then a different person who teaches it and a different person who mentors and a different person who assesses. Yeah. The whole thing yep. broken out into quite an elaborate division of labor. And there's good and bad of that in, in that, of course. But one of the intriguing pieces is that that you get rid of the bias of the faculty member assessing her own students. Somebody else does that. Yep. So you find out, um, they would say, they find out if real learning is going on because somebody else is making that assessment, not the person who's doing the teaching. That's just such an interesting concept. So foreign to the traditional thousand-year-old university model. Right. And I'm, I'm, I have been intrigued, as we've discussed. We, in a previous podcast, have had the president of Western governors on. And I have been intrigued at that notion of being untethered from the credit hour. Um, and as you've suggested, that that would take an enormous uh, amount of effort and uh, probably reaccreditation in some other manner uh, to do that. But, but as you look at, um, for example, in the the uh, report that you've written that we're citing today. And by the way, for our listeners, we will post a link uh, to Mr. Fain's report here so that you can uh, dig a little bit deeper and understand what we're talking about. But you, you mentioned that um, uh, you talked specifically about Capella University and Southern New Hampshire University and that direct assessment 
it, which is slightly different. We'd love to hear about the difference, uh, maybe specifically uh, between direct assessment version of uh, competency-based education. But also, you mentioned that there's been mixed reports from from regulators, accreditors. Um, mm -hmm. Can you go into that just a little bit? I'd be curious about what the mixed messages have been. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a saga, but uh, the, the cliff note version, um, you know, on the, on the kind of low end of transformational change when it comes to competency-based ed, would be institutions that are basically just doing uh, learning outcomes as competencies, you know, taking what they're supposed to be doing um, as required by their accreditors, but defining more granularly uh, what students should be learning in a program and calling them competencies. And I don't mean to be dismissive of that, that, you know, that's a step on the path to competency-based ed to start referring to your learning requirements as competencies. But on, on the much further end of that, uh, you have Western Governors, which you know, over 100,000 students uh, focused entirely on competency-based programs with, as we said, whole different ways of even doing instruction. Direct assessment uh, takes it a step further or at a different uh, direction in that you have full self-pacing possibilities, meaning that students can work through the required assessments at their own pace if they're able to essentially test out of competencies quickly, or they can do it. Um, if it takes them more time, they, will, they can take more time on specific competencies. So it just gives you a lot more flexibility and freedom around the traditional academic calendar, which is broken out into the credit hour standard of, you know, I think it's three hours of work outside of class and one hour in class per week in a, in a, in a credit uh, scenario. Um, that, that is not a requirement under direct assessment. Um, the first institution to try this was Southern New Hampshire University, I think about seven years ago. Uh, they got it approved by their accreditor, uh, Middle States, um, and the federal government gave them a green light uh, to, to give it a try. And, you know, the reason they have to do that is there are some financial aid rules and of course, that are tied to the credit hour. Um, so they did basically, they basically got approval to try something new. And, uh, you know, I know that for a lot of universities, the hardest part of all of this is structuring your financial aid around a totally unfamiliar schedule, um, a, total, a totally different way of doing things. Um, but Southern New Hampshire gave it a whirl and is still cruising along with their College for America, which is entirely direct assessment. Capella was next, and then about five other institutions have followed them. And a couple years into that, uh, the Inspector General for the U.S. Department of Education flagged the accreditation process for those programs, or, or a couple of them saying that they hadn't been adequately assessed. And, that you know, that mostly kind of was, was tied to the faculty role. Um, you know, are faculty members having the required amount of contact with students in these programs. You could see how that would be an issue if students are really working in a self-paced environment. It, you know, our, our regulatory structure doesn't really know how to deal with that. And um, the, the inspector general basically told the accreditors, hey, hold on here, let's make sure we're getting this right. And that had a chilling effect. Um, the accreditors were paused approving some of these. Um, some, some of them didn't get approval that were seeking it. I think the industry on the whole, because this is a lot of effort, decided maybe we need to wait and see if this is going to be a favored approach uh, by regulators and, and the federal government. But that, that essentially has blown over. It took a while. And I think that the gears are turning again, and it seems to have a lot of bipartisan support here in Washington. And the accreditors are, are open to this sort of innovation, they say, and it, it, I believe that they are, they've tried to adjust their structures to, to account for allowing uh, well-designed, competency-based and direct assessment programs to progress. Yeah, it complicates it when you bring in federal financial aid, doesn't it? 
very much so, I gather. Be- because all of a sudden now the federal government is saying, is this something that we're willing to pay for rather than just something yep. that an organization is doing? And the, um, the paradigm shift for education is actually very significant. If, if I would talk to um, a lot of our faculty here at Southern Utah University, they would say, well, you know what, really I am competency-based because we teach during the semester and if the student can show the competencies in the final exam, then they they get the good grade. But But right. this says you don't have to show up to one class if you already have the competencies under a direct assessment. You just walk in the first day, take the test, and... Um, and if you pass the test, then you, you're winning. And, and as opposed to the, I mean, because you've always been sort of able to test out of courses, but typically what we do when we do that is we waive that requirement. We don't actually grant credit. We just waive the requirement out of a major or something. Um, but uh, uh, in this particular case, they're granting credit for walking in and being able to do something. And credit leads yep. to financial aid. That's right. And credit is attached <laughs> to financial aid. We, we recently um, just changed our academic calendar from 15 weeks to 14 weeks. And just even mm-hmm. that shift, um, I, 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 should, I should say 15 weeks plus a, 14 weeks plus a test week. We, we recently just um, went right, right down to that model of 30 weeks that uh, are required by uh, federal financial aid, and just that change required us to really talk carefully about the ramifications yeah. of federal financial aid. Yeah, as a layperson who doesn't administer aid, I, I I can only rely on what I'm told, and it sounds like doing this doing during direct assessment or competency based ed is a really big lift, given the current structures. Uh, even more, you know, Capella. Big, largely online university, uh, you know, 15 years ago or so, converted their entire curriculum to competency-based, and and in a very meaningful way, not just window dressing. So they were well prepared for this, and still, and, and a big institution with some capital and ability to do things that smaller institutions aren't. They still said it was harder than they even thought it would be to to retool around the structure. And it's, it is aid mostly, but it's more than that. I mean, if you think about it, students graduate with a, a very different transcript. It's not grade based, it's competency based. And, you know, uh, all of these institutions, I believe, that do direct assessment are still giving, they're still mapping those competency based transcripts back to what looks like a more standard transcript that has the credits on it. Because if you're going to, you know, go to grad school or transfer, you need to help the, the, the other institution understand what you did. So even though they're doing this very experimental form of higher ed, they're still having to tie it back to the, the standard transcript and aid structures because, frankly, as a system, we're just not there right now. They're speaking a language that nobody else understands. Right. It's like walking and into a it, country where you're speaking one language and everybody else speaking a different one. It's really a challenge. And I think... The key to programs like this succeeding, I've heard, is that, you know, employers need to know what this is. You need to have employers, you know, at the table, frankly, in in helping understand what the competencies are. Or, frankly, I hear from a lot of places, you, you probably want employers helping define the competencies. And that is controversial. That's allowing employers into the academic process that, it's probably pretty difficult for people to understand why that should happen. But if you're Southern New Hampshire's College for America, you're graduating students with two-year credentials that are direct assessment. You want your employer having faith that the employers who are likely to hire these students that, that in what this is. So almost all of their students, I don't know if it's still the case, are based are are through employer partnerships where the employer has helped encourage the student that this is an option and that this credential will be honored. We have, we have a lot of mixed, um, when, when you discuss, Paul, the employer involvement, we have a lot of mixed feelings on all of our campuses around the country. 
when I was an undergraduate student, my major was philosophy. And my father was an electrical engineer professor. And he would say to me, you shouldn't be studying philosophy. That's, that's a, something you should study at home. You should go to the university to get a career, direct skills, right. credentials for a career. That's, that's what the taxpayer should be paying for. So we had these little conflicts over my undergraduate degree. And then, of course, um, on the other side of it, the faculty would say, well, we're not a vocational school. We're training people that can think and write yep. and understand. And you've got these, these two worlds that, um, that actually exist on every campus. We, oh, yeah. we have those debates internally all the time. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, as we get more sophisticated data about uh, return on investment for students, about employment and wages, which is a tricky issue in itself, it, you, you know this well, uh, those, those general ed, uh, liberal education skills are in high, high demand. And the philosophy major, they do pretty well, especially a few years out. Uh, the employers want people who can write and think, particularly in a knowledge economy where jobs are changing so fast. So it's a nuanced question. It, it's not just that people want you to know a technical skill. Um, and in fact, a lot of technical skills age out of value pretty quickly. Um, so th these are enormously tough questions. But I think there is a general agreement in the world that I cover that having employers for some programs, maybe not all, maybe not all the humanities, but having some input of what they value in employees is probably a good thing to do. <laughs> Yeah, to at least account right. for that. Right, and we have we have industry advisory boards that work with many of our departments, and they're they're um, embraced by the departments. The departments have sought them out, and it's it's half um, half of the reason is to is to is to um, help students and the department build connections to future jobs, and the other half is to help them make sure they're teaching the right things because we can forget what the right things are. Um, right. So there's a lot of good reasons for that. Well, even if you are, you know, speaking as a, a longtime classroom teacher who also was actively engaged in, in the, in, Paul, in, in my other life, I'm a musician. So I was actively engaged as a musician. Mm -hmm. the, the truth is that, that, if you have a day job as a professor, it's really almost impossible to keep the changes in your industry, whatever they are. And, and maybe the expectation shouldn't even be that. Um, uh, we, we, expect, we expect people to do research and we expect them to understand what's going on in their area generally. But the world has changed so quickly and so dramatically that I, I think it's very difficult to expect a person who who has a regular job working in a classroom at a university to also be um, at the very, very top of their game in terms of understanding what the changes are that are driving industry. Um, and and it, it, to me, always has made sense to ask the people that are on the pointy edge of that stick that are actually doing it for their input because we probably are insulated just a little bit from those changes. Yeah, and, and these are... As you, as you all know, very complex, controversial questions. But I think, you know, um, it depends on the program. It depends on the level of credential. But a, a good example I like to use on this is, you know, Google, a company we've all heard of, uh, created their own eight-month online certificate for entry-level IT jobs. It's all, you know, they literally produced the curriculum and all of the content. And they got industry sign off across a huge range of tech companies that this is the credential that you should have, that the, this covers the competencies we want. And now they're retroactively offering that credential for credit through partnerships with 30 plus community colleges. And so the question is what skills are needed for an entry level IT employee? 
this industry feels like maybe it needs to take the lead in doing that itself. That the need is, is profound and they can't fill their jobs fast enough and they feel like they could do this in a way that they could maybe do faster and better than higher education. I'm not defending that approach. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's probably the case for a second tier job in IT. I think, you know, and certainly a high level developer job, you need that computer science grounding that universities do best. Um, so it, it really depends on the job and the field. Yeah, it does. And, and what you have just described uh, in terms of Google and then retroactively getting credit at community college is a great way to illustrate this massive shift that um, competency-based and direct assessment in particular is, is threatening. I don't use yeah. I don't use threatening in a bad way, but it is threatening. It, it it takes universities from being this is a rough analogy, but it takes universities from being the dispensers of knowledge to being the certifiers certifiers of knowledge. So yeah. The the logical extreme is that a person finishes the last question and we say, You got it <laughs> yep. without having taken yep. a class. And in then that example terrifying i think for good reason to a lot of people well it is and and as we've talked about the complications for federal financial aid that could also mean that the person could be supported by the federal government for the equivalent of four years as they yep. as they just simply take tests right so it's not an easy it's not easy and yeah and you know i think go, go ahead i'm sorry no no and i was just saying if you're a for-profit company then we sometimes wonder if you're what your motives are. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think the supporters of this modality have been very careful to try to avoid a, a meltdown where a bad actor comes in, floods the market with low value credentials, and then the regulators come in. Uh, you know, familiar to anyone who followed the for profit industry's rise and frankly collapse. Um, it, you know, they're down to half the enrollment they were in the years after the recession, and it's had, the bottom hasn't been hit yet. So the federal government under Obama and, frankly, under Trump um, and the, the creditors and the foundations, frankly, that support this innovation have been pretty clickish. Like, if you, if you want to do this, you've got you've got to prove to us that you're going to do it well so you don't ruin the whole movement. And, mm -hmm. you know, Capella is a front runner. They're one of the pioneers of this field and very respected. They're a for profit. And it wasn't easy for them to get through that door. Um, you know, there, there are people watching this to make sure that it doesn't go bad. I don't know that they're going to succeed, um, but you, you can see the risk. And I think, you know, to, to get to the real brass tacks of what this is about to me, you know, the competency based ed, the exception of Western governors, has not taken off in a giant way. These are pretty small boutique programs. You know, Capella's got 7,000 people enrolled in their direct assessment program. So that's no joke. But still, this hasn't changed the whole world. But the underlying transformation to competencies that can be centrally determined seems to me to be the big thing. Like, a, I know a big university system is, is working on transforming their entire, uh, all of their curricula to competencies. And they're not requiring that you use them yet, but you could see where that's heading. You know, I think Western governors, um, in a more central way, determines what students should be learning. And then their coaches and others on the ground help help students. But that's, that's a very different way of determining what students learn than I think what traditional faculty members are used to. Yeah, and, and we talk about the worries, but on the upside, Wow, we all knew uh, people in school that were bored because they already knew everything. Yeah, and then they dropped out, or they struggled, or they didn't do their homework because it was it was just so easy for them. Certain subjects were easy for them. And uh, and what this does is we take you where you are, and then we teach you what what else you need to learn, and you can move as fast as you want and spend less time on the things you already know, and spend more time on the things you don't know. The concept of it is spectacular. Yep. Absolutely. And and in your you report, know, uh, we don't, I mean, we're not advertising for 
Capella or Western governors, certainly, because <laughs> that would not be in our best interest. But, <laughs> but sure. uh, nevertheless, you, you cite the fact that uh, the people, uh, the students that are in the Capella Flex Path program, um, there, there seem to be uh, a, a, quite a lot of data that supports the fact that it's significantly less expensive, that they um, persist at a higher rate, and that they finish more quickly all of which are yep. great goals for any university to have. Yeah, I think the concept of a more personalized approach to higher education is certainly attractive. And, you know, again, I don't think that means that you have to just be in the uh, certifying of prior knowledge business. I mean, that's part of it. But yeah, like if you're in a class and you you've already kind of mastered a concept and yet you have to sit along with others, I mean you can you can see how this would would give us advantages compared to that, you know. And as you say, Steve, the, the, the Capella's bachelor's programs, folks in the direct assessment were 59 percent faster in, in completing than ones in the the equivalent credit based ones, um, and you know I think. Part, I think when people think about this, it's it's they really focus on the fast learner who cruises through this. And you know, I wrote a story once about Southern New Hampshire had a a 21 year old student who was like the, the first one to complete their direct assessment credential. He was uh, working the night shift at a slim gym factory. A very smart kid who uh, just didn't have didn't think he could do community college because of his schedule. And was able to, to grab very rapidly to the course, and there are a lot of people like that um, through the program. But on the other end, if you do get hung up on something, if there's a concept that you can't master and you need more time, you need more help from coaches, this this modality is beneficial there as well. Right, and instead of ending the semester with a C, you you end the semester with a competency. Absolutely, and there's no gentleman C here. Yeah, a C may or may not be. Have, a person that gets a C may or may not have learned anything, but a person yep. that tests the competency may, may or may not too. It's it's really kind of a challenge. The yeah. One of the one of the uh, challenges that we hear about competency based education is that there are certain competencies that can't be tested. Yep. That. One of the things we're trying to do is is help students develop the soft skills and to help them develop more compassion and understanding to to not just be tolerant of people different, but to be inclusive and to develop um, an understanding of um, all of these things that make um, a democracy and communities work. And if we focus simply on competencies for a job, we've We've got it a big part of the role of the university. That's, and and um, I wish there was a way to test those competencies. I wish we could say, yes, you get an A in preparation to be a participant in democracy. <laughs> right. We don't really yeah. have a great way of testing that, but it is what we value. Now, but you know, when you when you kick the tires in some of these programs, they do try. You know, and and some of them. He may may do more to measure. I hate this term, but the soft skills that, than you might think. And yeah, I, well, the other point I might make is, you know, why, why can't you do that as well? Just because you have competencies that imperfectly measure some of these more intangible skills, and you can't offer instruction in those skills. You, you know what I mean? But I think it, it is fair to say that that's a concern. And, uh, you know, to be just totally blunt, there is just no doubt in my mind that competency-based education, particularly direct assessment, is going to be held to a higher standard than a 101 psych class where there are 500 students and somebody like me is in the back row reading a newspaper. You know, I think that's going to get a, a free pass in the way we assess and, and hold higher ed accountable compared to a modality that seems unfamiliar, and they're going to have to jump through more hoops to be accepted, no doubt. So, Paul, what do you think the outcome of that is? Because I think we agree with you that 
Yes. Nobody questions the fact that if a student sits in class or supposedly sits in class for 15 weeks and then gets a grade. Well, we, President, we've always said that, that face-to-face is, we, we have this debate about face-to-face versus online education. Sure. Face-to-face, no yeah, face-to-face education is terrific for the students in the first two rows who are actively engaged. But if you are, Paul, as you just suggested, in a room full of 300 people and you're reading the newspaper or, or today's equivalent of looking at your phone, yeah. Um, is that a better experience for you than uh, some sort of uh, self-paced, uh, you know, uh, direct assessed or, or just even a plain good old online program where you didn't feel compelled to sit there and waste 50 minutes or whatever the amount of time is? Uh, that, that, and, and yet we make those programs adhere to a higher standard. It's almost as though we are suggesting well, that person on the last row, you know, that's just, that's the cost of doing business. Um, and rather than us saying, no, we, we need to engage that person in the 15th row. We, this is know. one of the reasons why SUU doesn't have any 15th rows. That's right. We <laughs> pride ourselves on small class sizes, and that's one of the reasons. But I did talk to um, someone recently who's, who asked me how big our school was. And when I said what the enrollment was, he kind of, smiled and said, I had 7,000 students in my classical mythology class. Wow. And I thought, that kind of takes away our argument, doesn't it? That 7,000 students, you're not going to have any mentoring from the professor. You're not going to have those opportunities. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, these are big questions, as you know. I mean, how do we offer access to quality college education at scale is what a lot of these innovations are trying to do. I mean, I'm grossly simplifying, but Western Governors is able to offer a very affordable education in part because of what they've done with that unbundled faculty role. I mean, you can have a coach or a mentor who has a master's degree, not a PhD, who's located not in Washington, D.C., but someplace uh, more affordable, so you can pay less than you would pay a tenure track professor to work directly with the student. You know, I think that allows them to to do a scalable, low tuition model. And, but I think where it hits the real tough piece here, I mean, I think we all agree that it, it would be ideal if we could offer an affordable uh, job at the end of the the, the, the process. Uh, college education to everybody that's face to face that allows you to explore and and, and find what you want to do and and do all that without uh you know racking up a lot of debt. I think everyone in the country wants that and wants that for their children and themselves. We're not there right now. Uh, you know the default rate for African American students who borrow is fifty percent. I mean we are there are a lot of problems in American higher education. So. And also, we're talking about uh, yeah. modalities that for a lot of people, it's not like they were going to go somewhere else. You know, the, the right. example I was using in the ConAgra factory, it was College for America or a bus for that student. Right. Yeah, and, and, and we think about um, the single parent of um, three children living in a rural community that simply can't give away the job and can't move to go to school, can't. Yep. has to work all day long, and we're not really great at night schools. Yep. And to be able to meet students where they are, that's kind of the phrase that yeah. yep. gets used a lot. I think, you know, a direct assessment program can do that. You lose something in the process? Sure. And that's that's where it gets really tough. Yeah. Uh, the Weighing the, the advantages of affordability and accessibility versus some of the disadvantages that come with uh, direct assessment. And just real quick on that, one thing I thought that Capella does that's so smart, be, because they have a competency-based entire, you know, all of their programs, students can move back and forth a little easier. If, if direct assessment's not working out for you, you can go to the more standard, more direct assess, uh, more instruct, uh, direct contact with instructors, competency-based program. And, you know, frankly, the federal rules don't make that very easy either. You can't do a hybrid program right now. But I think if you can make this a less risky 
uh, endeavor for students where if it's not working out, you can you can move into a different program without losing credit. It's, it's a, probably the best way to go. Paul, you probably understand this as well as anybody because you're not administering it. You're questioning everybody that's doing it, writing about it. And, and as my dad used to say, you don't understand anything until you've written it. <laughs> yeah. Because it's the process of writing that other people can understand that forces us to under, to, to, to really get the point clear in our own heads. Where do you think this is going? Where do you think we'll question. be in 10, 10 years or 15 years? You know, about 10 years ago, I, uh, I went to go see a competency-based program in action at, at, at a face-to-face one where they did a, a pretty aggressive interview with a student about what they knew, a bunch of faculty members, and, and granted prior learning credits and, and helped place them in programs. And it kind of just clicked for me. You know, these were a couple of adult students who were career changers that I watched doing this process. And it, it was, it, I could see the value and how different it is, frankly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm going to make old addiction here, but I think people should be watching competency based education uh, because I think, in addition to kind of the growth of these programs and these early adopters who are trying this, that's one thing. But the underlying potentially transformative change to higher education on the whole, if it's more competency focused, is enormous. And, and you know, there's bipartisan interest in shaping our, our federal policy and probably at the state level too to be more amenable to that. So I think the kind of the rising tide of a focus on competencies will have a substantial impact on higher education in the next 10 years. And I think you're going to see more, like what, and one, one thing I'll say briefly, Western governors figured out a business model and a structure. Most other places haven't done that. I think it, we've done some reporting on how just haven't kind of figured out the price point and how to do this at what scale. I think other places are going to catch up and you'll see, you'll see more successful, very large programs. Well, these innovations either die or they become exponential. And yep. uh, exponential growth. I, I, we're seeing even here in Utah, the policymakers are asking us to look at these things and they're studying them more. So it, it feels like it's growing. Yeah, like this is going to take root, not not die yeah. away. This will be the, yeah. the exponential growth version of what you just said. And some industries, you know, the employers like this. They get this. They want to be part of this process more. They want to understand more what goes into a credential. You know, IT, advanced manufacturing, hospitality. You can see a couple of fields where this is it's really primed to, to, to take off. And I think that employer interest it shouldn't be discounted in predicting how big it could get. We had a... Um had an interesting conversation recently with a faculty member that was about um, creating the hybrid sort of program where you're face-to-face and online. And mm-hmm. and uh, ultimately where we landed was a recognition of there are just some people who cannot come to a campus, period. Yeah. And... Um, and some some value financial stability for the university or the institution and see the growth of these programs being financially good. But I have found that even among um, business-type faculty members, that's not a value that they hold. The value they mm-hmm. hold tends to be more social justice, upward mobility. And what what ultimately gets everybody is I really do want everyone to be successful, not just those select privileged few who have the ability to to take out four years or five years of their life and go to a campus because not everybody can do that. Absolutely. You know, one experiment to watch on competency-based education is happening in California right now. The state allocated a bunch of money for the community college system to try a fully competency-based online college that will be sub-degree. So no degrees, all certificates. And they're aimed at 25 to 35-year-olds, what they call the stranded worker, people who can't get to a campus, are stuck in a dead-end job, and could benefit from a credential. Um, The work is really hard. 
and it's not clear that they'll pull this off. But you can see the need. I mean, there are the degree attainment rates for some populations in California are terrible. Yeah. Uh, the stakes are pretty high here, and I, I think it's 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 definitely worth watching experiments to try to expand access in ways that people haven't been able to, to take advantage of. Yeah, well, and a degree is a ticket. It's a ticket to success. Um, and it feels to me like we should be doing everything in our power to broaden the number of people who can get those tickets. Absolutely. And to do it in a way, though, that the credential they earn is stackable, that they can continue on in their, their studies at another institution without losing a lot of credit, and portable. Uh, if you have a competency-based degree, you know, that's done with Google in a community college, let's say, that you can take into a different job and they recognize it. Those are big challenges, but it requires some systems change yep. that people are working on. We're not there yet, but people are working on it. Well, this has been um, really interesting, and I wish you'd have given us some bold projection, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to keep my job. You know? <laughs> Well, I've, I have felt that um, as, as we've kind of tracked this over the last several years, it, it seems to me anyway, and Steve and I have spent a long time talking about it, but it seems like within about 10 or 15 years or so, um, 15 or 20, that at least half of the degrees will be non-traditionally given online or something different than face-to-face. It's just I would second that. You agree with that? Yeah, it seems hard to believe that someone won't figure this out in a really scalable way. And, and just given the interest, I mean, politically, and it's not it's not just coming from one side. It's trying to do things differently. I, I got to feel like something's going to happen. Well, and yeah, and some of these schools have lofty goals. Yeah. Steve, what did um, Western governors say? They had yeah, a they goal want, of uh, had a million students. One million students. Yeah. If they can, yeah, and, if they can do that, that's the equivalent of a large number. Yep. Of face-to-face schools, we're eleven thousand. How many eleven thousand universities would be put out of business if one online program could serve a million? Yeah, I agree. And you know, just listening to Western governors talk about what they can do kind of tailored, customized credential with a big employer. So, wow, you know, that, that seems very, that seems like a powerful thing to offer. And they're not the only ones that they're really good at it. But Southern New Hampshire, Arizona State, there are others that are pushing pretty far, pushing the envelope on this stuff. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. We've had as our guest today Paul Fain, who is a reporter and news editor at Inside Higher Ed. Paul joined us by phone from his office in Washington, D.C., and we thank Paul for the discussion, which has been stimulating, and we thank you, our loyal listeners, for tuning in. We'll be back again next week with another podcast. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.